There is a boy who is just like other boys. Until one night, he sees from his window a storm on the horizon. Howie, who are you? I'm Peter Pan, and you can. All of a sudden, at three years old, Owen vanishes. The doctor says, let me explain what autism is. Some of the kids don't ever talk again. I remember thinking, I'm just going to hold you so tight and love you so much that whatever is going on will go away. We're beginning to give up hope. And one day, we're watching the Disney animated movies. And he says he doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan. What the hell just happened? <laughs> and all of a sudden, it became clear to us. He's using these movies to make sense of the world he actually is living in, our world. So at that point, we began to speak to him in Disney dialogue. When did you and I become such good friends? <laughs> Whatever works to get to Owen. <laughs> I've been scared my whole life of growing up. Peter Pan doesn't want to grow up because when you grow up, you lose all your magical childhood times. My hope is that he is independent enough to be able to grow older on his own. When I look in the mirror, I see a proud autistic man ready to meet a future that is bright and full of wonder. He's going to have to fall and fail. We're not afraid of that as we used to be. I just can't believe how far Owen has come. The future, I'm still searching for it. Who decides what a meaningful life is? It's like I always say. Children got to be free to lead their own lives. Well, that's the trailer, but you have to watch the entire movie, um, which I did within three hours of getting the link from Ron. Uh, I was in London, and for some reason, Debbie reached out to me and asked, would I host this particular uh, talk of authors at Google? I'm like, Ron Suskind? Are you kidding me? Life animated? And I will tell you, it's not only because Ron is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and uh, has written many books. Um, but it was specifically because I remember exactly where I was sitting, what office I was in, when somehow someone sent me a link to a New York Times, New York Times story about you, your wife, and your son, yeah. and how Owen uh, discovered his voice uh, through relating to Disney characters. And I immediately shot it to my husband. I said, oh my god, someone else has had the same experience. My son Patrick is 23. He has a condition called Fragile X Syndrome, which has autistic-like characteristics associated with it. And he, indeed, learned to speak through Disney Pixar. His modus is really Toy Story. So It's a great choice. It's, it's a great a, movie. It's a great so movie. So ton there to work with, tons to work with. So Ron, we could talk a lot about your credentials, but what was striking to me in my first conversation with you was the excitement uh, and the belief and the purpose that your life has. Um, probably you always had it. You're a serious journalist. But there's something magical that's happened through telling Owen's story. Yeah. And you could see in your bio, one could say you've had a 20 plus year struggle, I would say journey, yeah. a hero's journey, yeah. of raising a child like Owen. So can we talk a little bit about that segment we saw uh, Owen, little curly haired boy, loses his voice. What's it feel like? And looking back now, tell us about that journey. Hmm. And I know we're going to intersperse our discussion with clips from the yep. um, documentary. So we'll have moments to illustrate points. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because uh, folks know the other books. This is my sixth book. And the other books, I read a book called A Hope in the Unseen, Inner City African American Kid Who Goes to the Ivy League, and then four books on presidents and power, you know, where I was investigated and things like that, and big, noisy books. 
about America and America's role in the world. And, and what's interesting is this story was the story behind all of those stories. It wasn't that we were hiding it, but we became clear as we grew, Cornelia and I, that, that Owen was really driving us to, as Owen would say in his parlance, uh, to, that we were sidekicks uh, trying to find our inner heroes. Now, can you describe for this audience who might not be Disney yeah. aficionados what a sidekick is? OK, so, so I'll just jump a little bit ahead, but it's a big architecture that Owen has kind of created in his head over many years. Where so Owen is um, uh, thrown out of a school when he's about 11 years old. Now, um, already he had memorized 50 Disney animated movies as sound alone. And we were talking in Disney dialogue. That's how we communicated. That's the only way we could communicate. But he gets to a point where he doesn't have a lot of speech, enough, but uh, he's whacked. I mean, he begins to see what the world sees of him when he's thrown out of the school he loves and deemed uneducable. And he goes to the basement, and he begins to draw with peculiar intensity. Uh, he's grabbing books and pads. We don't know what he's doing. It's like he's working on a project. And I go down to the basement a few months into this period, and, and we know he's busted up. And he's really broken, but he can't tell us how he feels, which is terrible for a parent. And I, I grab a book, and I open it up, and I see there are 100 pictures precise, just like a Disney animator would draw, all sidekicks, no heroes. Sebastian, when Ariel loses her voice, says, look and feel, Ariel, no! <gasps> There's 10 of those. Nice West Indian voice. That's, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, I mean, we do voices in our family, just it's so the way we... we talk to each other. And, it, and, and, uh, and uh, 100 sidekicks, no heroes. Of course, he saw that the world had judged him. As he told us later, he's not a hero, he's a sidekick. Now, we ask Owen later, he says, he says, well, sidekick's important. They help the hero fulfill their destiny. Without them, nothing happens. And I'm a sidekick. And Does at the that end make of the, you the hero? Well, it's hard to know, because he's grown into the hero. But at the end of the book, he writes two things. One is, I am the protector of the sidekicks. Love that. And the last thing he writes, no sidekick gets left behind. In a way, this is his answer back to what the world sees of him. You know, I was already out as a journalist writing about the left behind people of the world in inner city America, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, folks who were in the discard pile. Of course, the most left behind person I knew was living in the bedroom. Mm. And more and more over the years, as Walter says, Owen's older brother, Owen is our best teacher, silent child for many years, making sense of the world, what he can grab from the wide world of content, the web, an image, and turning it into a vessel that becomes a vessel that we all can board. And that's what we have now with the movie, that everyone's boarding this ocean liner of making sense of the world through passion, through the things we love, through things that are often not validated as important. But they are. It's what we do with them. It's how we own them, how we fit them to our lives. And that's why we're having so much fun with this movie. I mean, you know, it's amazing. So we like won the Director's Award at Sundance. That's where it was right. debuted in January. And this was the first time we saw it with people. And Owen is there. And Cornelia and Walter saw it for the first time at Sundance, which oh, wow. is audacious. You know, as you can see, I'm married to an audacious woman here, ferocious. And she's like, well, look, we know our life. The question is, will people get our life? And we'll know it at Sundance with 1,000 people. At the end of the movie, the lights come up. And Roger Ross Williams, an amazing director, Academy Award winner, says, ladies and gentlemen, Owen Suskind. Owen bounds down on the stage, and everyone is up. And I've never heard cheers like this. I mean, they just cheered themselves hoarse. And Owen's just feeling this wash over him. I mean, the whole thing started with the book and then the movie, you know, six years ago, where Owen said to me, and Cornelia's like, you know, he, he's like, people don't see me for who I am. He's the hero, though. Well, that's mm. what's 
emerge, but he has a different twist on it. He says, really, really, we're all really sidekicks at our best when we help others fulfill their destiny. And on that day, we find our inner heroes, but we're really sidekicks deep down. And you don't get redrawn in this life. I love that. Because it, it means that these notions of heroism that are often very brittle are, are now recast by a left behind person to say, heroism is a choice of what you do to help someone else fulfill their destiny, and in that way you fulfill your own. That's a beautiful recasting that, of course, someone with autism does, because that's their gift. You know, and so much of what we see here is a display of what I call compensatory gifts. And all, I have all these neuroscientists. I'm like living in neuroscience fantasy camp these days. You know, I can call them on the phone. <laughs> like, Mitzel, we got right the great here. Tom Minsel here. He's like a, like a rock star. And, we'll all, and a Googler. And a Googler. <laughs> so Tom, just so you know, he's sitting near me here. Tom was the head of the National Institute of Mental Health since 2002, right? And Tom was already a big autism researcher. But then he sat in really the hot seat you know, of an era when, when at Tom's behest, we began to redefine a neurodivergence as maybe not all the big P pathology we thought it was. To say, look, yes, the deficits and the disabilities are profound, but it's more complicated. And what my neuroscience friends tell me is that for every deficit that is visible, and we measure them religiously, exhaustively, Somewhere, there's an equal and opposite strength. The question is not if, but where. The brain, neuroplasticity, its, its definition, a working definition, is that the brain finds a way with often enormous ingenuity. And that neural pathway is a strength. Now, Owen is bursting with compensatory strengths in this movie. And it's not something we knew for a long time. For a long time, we said, oh my. What's going to happen? What will his life be like? Can, and so that's our journey. Can you tell us the moment that you recognized this compensatory strength? Was it that first phrase he mm -hmm. uh, uttered in the movie that Cornelia responded to? Or, I mean, he comes out with profound heroic statements yeah. uh, about the nature of humanity yeah, in yeah. this movie. So. Well, look, let's, we got a couple of clips. Let's do a clip. So let's do the clip. Right now you can see it happening where you see Owen as a little guy, he's two and a half, uh, he's got a few hundred word vocabulary like a typical two and a half year old. We're living in what we call then the continent of normal, whatever that means. We didn't even know we lived there until later, <laughs> until we were exiled from there. <laughs> okay, so we're living in this lovely house in Dedham and you can see the clip and then I'll tell you what happens. Daddy and Owen, fighting with swords in the leaves. Oh, who are you? I'm Peter Pan, and you Captain. Oh, I'm Captain Hook, you're Peter Pan. OK, come on, Pan, you're a demon. Yeah. <laughs> There's a video we came across. And then once we found it, we couldn't stop watching it. Oh, thank you, thank you. That's very chivalrous <laughs> of you. Now, now, in a way, it's, it's just an unremarkable video of a dad and a son playing. I'm chasing Owen around. He's chasing me around. He's Peter Pan. I'm Captain Hook. Oh, no. At the time we shot it, I'm in my early 30s. I'm a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And our life is taking shape just the way we'd want it. We had two beautiful boys. We just had our second boy. We had a little tiny house, but it was just like our dream house. You want to say hi to mommy? Hi, mom. Hi, God. You know, everything was falling into place. All of a sudden, at three years old, Owen vanishes. Goodbye, Peter Pan. 
So that's the before time. Uh, we moved to Washington about a week after that was shot. Um, you know, exciting time. I was became the senior national affairs writer for the Wall Street Journal. Job, job got to kill people to get it. I killed ten guys to get the job. <laughs> nice family men, good guys. And um, uh, and uh, and we're just in a hubbub. You know, boxes unpacked. Uh, new school for Walt. New job for Dad. And a couple weeks in, about a month, Cornelia's like, something's wrong with Owen. He's he's unhappy. He was always a happy guy. And he's and. He, then he, he's not looking at you. I mean, I stopped telling her what was happening at work because every day she had another story. Mm. And he's losing speech. Mm. About three months in, that few hundred word vocabulary is down to a single word juice, one word. Uh, and we, we don't know what's happening. I said, it doesn't make sense. Kids don't grow backwards. Maybe he banged his head when we weren't looking or ingested something toxic, God forbid. So we see a doctor, so you need to see a different doctor, a specialist. And we see her, and she says, autism. You know, what did we know? We knew Rain Man, 1988. That's what most people knew. This is, this is 1994, first months of 94. I said, you're telling me my son is like Dustin Hoffman in that movie? She's like, well, maybe. A lot of them don't speak again, though. You know, he might not talk anymore. Yeah, we didn't hear anything else in the in the visit, after that, our, all we heard was noise in our ears. You know, Cornelia and I literally lifted out of our bodies. We're floating at a drop ceiling, just like this, looking down on the scene. The kid in the rug looking at his hands, the doctor, and these two parents. You know, I mean, we used to say, you know, we, you know, we left them in there. They didn't leave with us, those parents. You know, I used to miss them. But we don't anymore, because we were starting a journey where we were, oh, and changed, but we were changing, which we didn't realize. So off we went into a time of silence and panic. Uh, you know, we found a new doctor, which was good, you know. And the first thing he says to me is, what do you do for a living? I'm like, me? I'm a reporter. He's like, I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> I'm like, why? <laughs> so you're good with numbers? I'm like, yeah, I'm at some you know, I test OK. Investment banking, a terrific career choice. I'm like, what do you mean? So you just paid me 120 bucks for this visit. You're going to need to see me three times a week. It's not covered. Wow. Oh, oh God. <laughs> I said, look, this is what I do. I'm a story guy. I, I'm a, you, better be re, he said, you better be really good at it. <laughs> That's right. We were bankrupt by the summer, you know? And then we were just living in fear. Now, Owen is silent at this point, no words. Uh, but he's murmuring a few months in a little gibberish. He's saying, juice servos, juice servos. You know, we're like, sounds, sounds are good like a baby. And Cornelia thought he wanted more juice, but he didn't want the juice. You know, he knocked over the sippy cup. He had graduated the big boy cup, but the motor function goes crazy with autism. The one area it worked, though, the motor function, was his thumb on the remote. Sure. The thumb on the rewind button. His brother taught him how to use the, the re rewind, and he watched The Little Mermaid a lot. Now, how many people here have seen The Little Mermaid? Every single person. <laughs> what was his favorite scene? Because well, I'm he, sure he, he had well, one. He had one. He went back. Just like you know this with Patrick. So the scene he loved was where Ariel uh, loses her voice, where she makes her deal with Ursula ah. the Sea Witch. Okay. So you know Ariel, a selfish girl, wants what she wants. Do anything to get it. She, she's working now at Goldman Sachs. She's doing fine. <laughs> The whole Eric thing didn't work out. The, print, the whole Prince thing doesn't usually work. So, uh, and so she'll make her deal with the sea witch. And of course, she, you know, the sea witch says, it won't cost you much a trifle, really, just your voice. Owen oh, rewinds it. Walter's like, oh, and just watch the movie. Second rewind, third rewind. Wow. Cordelia grabs me. It's not juice. I said, it's not juice. It's just, just I grab voice. Owen, just your voice. And he, he looks at me for the first time in a year. And he says, juice or fuzz, juice or fuzz, juice. Mm -hmm. Walter starts jumping in the bed. Owen's talking again. And Cornelia starts to cry and says, he's still in there. 
This goes on for years. We see our doctor the next day, Alan Rosenbott, terrific guy, says, look, sit down. You're not going to like this word. This is called echolalia. I'm like, oh, I hate that word. <laughs> is it what? Yeah, it's kind of what it sounds like. Like a parrot? Like He's like, parrot. yeah, they're just repeating the sounds. The thinking is they don't understand them. I mean, we call this our Helen Keller moment. So that's where we live for years, between the pet store and Helen Keller. And he's murmuring more gibberish, scripting, we call it, taking little pieces of dialogue. The view then is not only is the Disney obsessive, but it's not uh, productive for him to be doing that. Jump ahead to the next scene, actually, where, uh, so you met me in Cornelia, this extraordinary woman who is also a journalist like me, but as soon as Owen's diagnosed, she's like, I have my job forever, him, and, and your job is to make a more money than any reporter in the history of newspapers. <laughs> Go ahead. Why don't you write a book? Out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> Enjoy. Have fun. So, so uh, right. I mean, thank God I want to pull a surprise soon thereafter, but necessity is the mother of terrific invention, trust me. Um, uh, so Owen uh, and Cornelia and I are at the core of it, but there's another key actor here, which is Walter, who is as important a character in this movie as anybody in the book and our life. Now, he's the sibling, and he's like a lot of siblings of people with disabilities. You know, from early on, he sees mom and dad are really overwhelmed here. So I'm good. I'm on my own. It's like a little character out of Dickens. You know, <laughs> see ya. Okay, David Copperfield. So, so Walt is tough and resilient and can handle any of the world throws at him. This is the story Cornelia and I tell each other about Walt. Because, you know, I'm a story guy, and this is a lot about story, the stories we tell ourselves to make our way in the world. Owen does it, too. So the story about Walt was that, the Jewish Marine, and when <laughs> the world throws at him, but he'll never leave his little brother behind. Two-part story. We don't even notice he gets emotional on only one day of the year, his birthday. It doesn't fit our story. So on Walter's ninth birthday, Owen's almost seven. Walt's in the backyard with the other kids. The kids leave. Owen's back there. Walt gets a little weepy. Owen follows us back into the kitchen. Now, at this point, after years of therapy, I mean, morning, noon, and night, Owen's up to a three-word sentence, I want juice. When we're feeling OK about that, that's at least he can say what he wants. He follows us into the kitchen. He looks at Cornelia, he looks at me, like something odd, something's bubbling up. And he goes, Walter doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan, and off he goes. We're like, what's that? It's like a thunderbolt went through the kitchen. So we're struck silent, and then we can't stop talking for hours. Finally, Cornelia says to me, like, look, you're the crazy one. You were at the propeller hats at the birthday parties. Find a way in. I'm tired. I'm up every night with them. This is your job. You know, the guys don't often get a prompt where they can try to lift the back of the Volkswagen. That's mostly the mom. So I go up. And it's this very night that this occurs. So let's play that second scene. So I go up to his room. I see Owen on the bed, flipping through a Disney book. And I see, sort of over to my left, I see Yago, the puppet. Now Yago, is the evil sidekick to the villain Jafar from Aladdin. Now I know Owen loves his puppet. Jafar! Jafar! Get a grip! I grab the puppet, I pull it up to my elbow, and I begin to crawl across the rug as quietly as I can. And Owen turns to the puppet like he's bumping into an old friend. I say to him, Owen, Owen, how does it feel to be you? And I said, not good, because I don't have any friends. Now I'm under the bedspread, and I just bite down hard. You know, I just say to myself, stay in character. And I say, OK, OK. Owen, when did you and I become such good friends? And he said, when I watched Aladdin, you made me laugh. And then we talk. Uh, Owen and Yago, 
for a minute, minute and a half. It's the first conversation we've ever had. So what happens after the two minutes, after we have this moment, all of a sudden, Owen clears his throat. <clears throat> and he says, I love the way your foul little mind works. <laughs> That's Jafar. It's the next line. And I throw up the bits like, ah, we're talking in Disney dialogue. Oh my God. This is the way we'll communicate. The next night, we start what we call the basement sessions. OK? Uh, we, Jungle Book was big. Owen loves Jungle Book. So we had to, all four of us go to the basement. Now, you know, I'm going to be blue, which you know, kind of works other than the, the height thing. Uh, <laughs> Cornelius Bagheera, the protective panther. Walter's King Louie. Oh, Tell me King the Louis secret of man's red fire, man cub. And <laughs> Owen's Mowgli. And off we go, scene after scene. Now, we need the screen, because Owen's going to outrun you quick. He's memorized 50 movies. All of them. You know, he can go for hours. So we do a scene, we refresh, we do it, we do it. So about the seventh scene in, it's a scene where Baloo says to Mogu, he says, you know you'd make one great bear. And Mogu says, you think so, Papa Bear? And then, um, and then Owen hugs me. And I'm not sure if it's Mogu and Baloo or me and Owen. And of course, Cornelia says, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't. And that's what happens. We move forward for years playing animated characters. That's how Owen gets his speech back over years. He learns to read by reading credits, all tapping intrinsic motivation. This is part of autism. They're self-directed, just like poets are. This is what I do. This is who I am. They won't do the transactional one size fits all thing. They'll never do it. And they'll never succeed doing it. So we, we start living a double life. Oh, the whole family. By day, you know, Walt's going to school, uh, you know, riding his bike in blizzards because he doesn't want Cornelia to drop him off and have Owen come in. So then it'll be about his brother. What's with the brother? You know, uh, Cornelia's running ragged. You know, I'm interviewing presidents, <laughs> some of whom I know are not telling me the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure of it. Uh, <laughs> And at night, we're animated characters in the basement med meditating on the emergence of the hero. Were you conscious that you were meditating on the emergence of the hero? Owen, or did that come Owen over made time? us conscious of it because he was starting, as Patrick does, as, all, as so many of the folks do, he was starting to use the narrative frames and tropes as structures to understand himself. And so in a way, Owen, through these years, starts to lead, like saying, no, no, this, this character has not fulfilled his destiny. And, and this character here is confused, but here's the twist. This character advances the plot. He was looking for people who are advancing the plot in his own life to match the mirror and code breaker that the content provided. Again, we didn't know really what we were seeing. Now we know. Now all of our neuroscience friends and the therapists and the clinicians say, yeah, yeah, this is, this is the way it actually is working and works. The content they embrace is a choice which shows the way their brains actually work, what, what feeds them. The map kids might be different from the Disney kids, but they all do it the same way. They use it as their mirror, their map, their guide, their vessel. Now, for us neurotypicals, we're like, ugh. Gosh, if, if I have to watch Dumbo one more time, I'm going to run away with the circus. <laughs> but then you're like, no, no, Cornelia said it best. Loving what he loves is the way we are going to love him. And we'll do it all together. And we're going to live in this underground cavern that he's building. It's like an underground palace. So another clip is Owen going forward when you're going to see that that as he gets into, through his teenage years, he, he moves out into the world, goes to a school on Cape Cod called Riverview. And, you know, it's a big jump for him. He's leaving home, uh, and he starts Disney Club. You know, we know other kids are doing this, but we don't really know it in terms of something we can touch. So here is Disney Club. This is very cool. Okay, okay, that's enough. As soon as everyone gets here. 
Oh, we'll begin. Well, yeah. Could I just recommend that instead of saying listen up, you say may I have your attention? May I have your attention, please. When everyone gets here, we'll begin. I started a Disney club so I can get to know more people and they can be around me so I can be more popular. Um, Shannon? It worked. Tonight we're watching Summer Lion King because this year is the big 20th anniversary of the original release of The Lion King. Yeah, sure. Shall we? Yeah. The, the, not only am I a big Disney fanatic, but I also like to play m magical movie scores on this piano. Yeah. We watch parts of Disney animated films and discuss them and, and see what they're really about in our lives. The first Disney club we went to uh, Owen come, goes to school in Cape Cod. We were living in Washington. I was, you know, fighting it out in that terrain, and and I, w I came up to Harvard to be the writer in residence. So we're only an hour away, because and it was kind of better. We were close to Owen. That was far Washington to Cape Cod, and we we're just an hour down the road. And Owen starts at the school, and he and he starts Disney Club. We're like fabulous. This is great. He never even been in a club, and I was the president of a club. <laughs> And so we're like, what do you do every week? Well, we watch Disney movies and eat popcorn. I'm like, OK, you need to do something. You know, you're, you need a program. So about eight months in, after Cornelia and I are hocking him every week, he's like, well, they said we can have parent advisors. So I guess you guys can come. So of course, you know, we make it from Harvard Square to the Cape in 32 minutes. You know, and we get into the room, and there's, and there's 12 kids just like him. That's the revelation. And they're watching Dumbo as the, the first time we, which is a great choice, really. I mean, it's one of the quintessential narratives. And you know, if Joseph Campbell was sitting here with us, or Maria Tartar from Harvard, the folklore chief is my buddy, she'd say, yeah, these, Dumbo's a story. Humanity's been telling itself for thousands of years in every culture, just like Beauty and the Beast and Snow White. The Brothers Grimm took them, Disney took them. They're, they're the, the tales that help us manage our life. They're not simple. They're quite complicated, in fact, in terms of all the human attributes that are challenged and then express themselves. So I say to this, this young lady sitting there, I'm like, Dumbo. She's like, that's my number one. I go, OK. So you, tell me why. She's like, OK. Well, well, I didn't talk for a long time and Dumbo doesn't talk. What we find out later is many of the nonverbal kids are bonding with nonverbal characters. Of course, of course. Express all emotions without words. She said, but then I learned to talk, and you know, and I was an outcast for all, much of my life, junior high school. And then I saw what it was about. You see, the things that made Dumbo an outcast, those ears, you know, he learns that they're his greatest strength and allow him to soar. And that's the way it is with me. The things that make me different are my greatest strengths. And I can soar too. That's why I'm a Dumbo girl. That's all Owen needed to hear. That's Emily, his girlfriend. It's like, that's, it. that's the one for me. I mean, well, let's just say, are you getting more than that with 10 dates of small talk? I mean, really? No. You know that's no. So they become a couple. By the time he's doing this third year, where he's the president for three years, there's like eight boy-girl couples in Disney Club. They're speaking a language. They share. It's a lingua franca of their affinity, their interest. A language just like the languages we talk. And so what's really powerful about this is what it helps us see uh, with new eyes, I guess Proust would say, as to the way people find each other in a way they can now and they kind of couldn't when I'm a kid, based on their powerful interests that define them and that they can go 100 feet deep on. You know, we are talking a minute ago with one of the young ladies here about you know, her bro your brother, right? Yeah. And he's, a, what is he, Disney, or what's his thing? Yeah, he loves Disney. Disney. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things I thought about is, is, you know, little technological changes sometimes have enormous effect. And the one that all of you, I think, probably know is when the VCR arrives for home use in home penetration around the mid-'80s. That's actually huge. Because content then was on free feed, on demand. 
And everyone built up those little libraries. Remember the little clamshell boxes of the VCRs and VHS tapes? And, uh, and that was really important for Owen. And I dare say that before that, there were probably more kids who were map kids and train schedule kids. Huh, and more of them migrated over to videos because they were getting more from them as models, as mirrors, as really kind of clues that they could really decipher. And, and that's kind of big. Because what's happening now is that Disney clubs, every kid who left that room went out into the world after they graduated and started a Disney club, <laughs> which is neat. So now virtually they can meet other people and they can share the thing that defines them. That's a very exciting change. And the other change is that when people hear Owen and the other kids in that room talk about what they see in a movie all of us have seen, they're like, how can they see so much more in the movie than I do? And I test really well. Mm. What's going on here? That's good. That kind of upends lots of things that end with a lot of people being dismissive of those who don't fit one-size-fits-all models of measuring ability or value or, or in a way meaning. You know, there's a line in the middle of the movie that jumps off the screen. And every time I hear this, and Cornelia says it, I, I cry every single time, where, where she says at one point, and it's because someone challenged us, and an expert, in fact. And we could see the way she looked at Owen, and it wasn't the way we saw him. It was a little bit like, you know, the broken toy. Mm. And she said, you know, Ron once said to me, you know, she says, 40 feet tall on the screen, uh, he said, who decides what the meaningful life is? Who makes that call? And the idea of the who is a challenge that you may not be making that decision in ways you think. Maybe the culture, maybe certain ideas of success, maybe the tyranny of the UAs. Ooh, Harvard. Ah, Cape Cod Community College. Mm. Huh. And why is she only talking about that one son and not the other? All that shapes us. And I think it shapes us often unconsciously. Owen called that question in our family. And that made us better, really measurably better. You know, when I say he helped us find our inner heroes, that's how he did it, by forcing the question. So that question, in what I consider progress, was discussed last week at Dartmouth, where they saw the movie and university-wide they did discussion groups asking that question, who decides the meaningful life? Are you deciding? Someone deciding that for you? You don't even realize it, they are. I love that conversation. And in three weeks, the entire Houston public school system, all of them, all the staff, 29,000 people, and all 200,000 students are going to watch the movie wow. and ask that question. Now, mind you, many of them are African American or Latino American students from tough circumstances. And the prompt will be, you decide what the meaningful life is. Don't let anyone impose that on you. That's your choice. And the last thing I'll say about this is about three months ago, we had an amazing moment where we watched the movie. They screened it at Disney. Yeah, I know. It was crazy. <laughs> it was like a gigantic catharsis in a theater. I think they should employ him. Come on. OK. Uh, is this being telecast? Uh, I'm calling Burbank, California. Uh, no, I mean, Disney has been great to Owen, in fact. And he knows lots of people at Disney. And they love him, and he loves them. Of course, he knows every credit. They've ever, I mean, he's like a walking IMDb, <laughs> which they love, of course. No one knows that, really. My wife doesn't know that. Owen knows it. So, Owen knows it. so, so uh, they screen the movie, and uh, one of the animators, you know, they're all bawling their eyes out, and they're cheering. And, and one of them said, Owen, what, what about that question that your mom asks? about the meaningful life. Who decides the meaningful life? And the room got very quiet. It's a challenge in a way. And Owen just sat there for about 30 seconds. He said, um, he said I, I do. I decide. 
you know, boy, that feels like justice kind of to me. So that's what's happening. Well, Ron, I, I could ask a thousand questions. I think we have another video clip to yeah, show. Yeah, we before. have 20 minutes still and for questions minutes, and this so little video. So we're, we're okay, are we okay? We're good. Okay. We're good. Because I don't even need to be here. We'll just put, wind them up. <laughs> <laughs> no, Eileen, without no. you, I don't I wouldn't. What would no. I do? But I'm, here are psychic. some things that have occurred to me. She's my psychic. She's I'm the psychic. Her, I'm not used to being the psychic. And she's fulfilling her own. But there is something in this journey as a parent. Um, and you know, at, at a point in your life, I'm sure you had sorry eyes. Your yeah, sister, your cousin, you know, much your cousin. Oh, I'm so sorry for you. What people don't r recognize is the enrichment, the, the, the enrichment that comes with having non-conventional situations in your life, yeah. and the strength that comes with finding other pathways in. Sounds to me, though, you just had an intuitive moment there with Iago ah, and followed it quite naturally. A lot of the techniques that are introduced to parents is, you know, kind of get there into their passion area. In my child, it was subways, horses, and Disney. Those were the three paths in. Uh, and as a reward for his first use of the big boy toilet, my son, I was bundled in the cold going home one night from work and I see my husband and son leaving the apartment and I shout across the windy streets of New York, where are you guys going? Patrick pooped in the potty, we're going to the subway. Oh my God. <laughs> that a, that's amazing, it's amazing. Guess where you wanted to go the next day? The subway. subway yeah. I'm like, no, 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 it's not every time. <laughs> So we've gotten over that particular instance. But uh, we, it, it, you just knew that you had to kind of reward or follow a passion. Um, I, one of the first conversations I had with Patrick was while he was speaking to a horse. Yeah. He'd gone away to school in Boston. He came back, and we were near a horse breeding farm where there was this one horse traveler whom he loved. And then we walked up with our carrots, and he starts speaking in full, clear sentences. Oh, traveler, my buddy, my friend, I've mm. missed you so much. How have you been? You're getting bigger, bud. Yeah. A whole conversation, I'm like, what about me? You want to ask me how I'm doing? So, you but, need to start whinnying is what you need to <laughs> stamping your foot. But we, we absolutely indulge those passions. And so what can you, I mean, some of us might be parents, siblings, interested parties. Um, we may be neurotypically atypical ourselves in this room. What can you tell us about raising a child with extra needs and accessing these passions as paths in and enrichment for your own life? Well, it, you know, I, I love your horse story. And the subways, of course. I mean, in a way, Patrick is not, uh, he's not ingesting context or the supposed to's. So he sees things as they are. Look, I mean, we think subways, oh, what's the big deal? Subways are amazing. They are amazing. I mean, think about it. A train that runs underground, jammed with people. I mean, that's an amazing creation. And we are taught as little kids, horses can't understand what you're saying, but they kind of do. Patrick doesn't know better, so he tries things that we're taught not to do. And I think that's a big part of this, is you've got to look at yourself as not necessarily superior, which is hard to do sometimes to the individual. You say, they are my peer. I'm just different, that's all. So part of that is looking at the neurotypical differences you have to them. And that's sometimes hard to look at yourself that way. But that's the key, actually. Because then uh, you'll burn off a lot of neurotypical blind spots that you either have or are sort of taught to embrace. I mean, I'll give you an example. A famous molecular biologist, I won't say what his name is, a great guy, he's a friend of mine, called me up when he had read the book two years ago, and he says, gosh, you know, I wish my kid, you know, Paul, let's say, was a Disney, is a Disney kid. I wish he was a Disney kid, he's a map kid. Hmm. And I'm like, okay, so we're on the phone. I'm like, so the question is, are all of these affinities created equal? And all of a sudden, we start to think. You know, wait a second, maps are the two-dimensional rendering of all humanity. The cartographers are the great geniuses of their age. You know, everything's in a map, if you know where to look. 
I tell them that my friend said, you need to start speaking MAP with your kid. <laughs> a month later, they've been speaking MAP for a month. He calls me up. He's like, an amazing thing happened. And he talks to me about how the kid expressed love by identifying a city on a map that, that represented in its characteristics his father. A girl comes up to me at the Semmel Institute not too long ago. I gave a speech over the UCLA. Perfect example, a dinosaur girl. I'm like, dinosaurs, great. So teach me. That's the way you do it. You are an expert. I'm not. Teach me. OK? And she's like, OK. I said, what's your favorite? She's like, I, I don't want to tell you. You'll laugh at me. I said, I promise I won't laugh. OK, the velociraptor. I'm like, that's a, OK, that's a vicious animal. Okay. <laughs> so why the raptor? OK, well, um, the raptor, it's a pack animal. You know, and all pack animals are not all the same. You know, they move together, and they need to recognize what each does well. And if they work together, they can take down much larger dinosaurs. So it's about interdependency and about relying on each other and seeing each other as we are, really. And that's why I love the raptor. I mean, there's not a paleontologist in the world that would come up with that. What I love about that is she's drawing from the affinity what she needs to know herself. Hmm. That's the reversal of the telescope. That's what's happening. And that's why when you feed these affinities, these individuals grow into these mighty individuals. <laughs> you know, they're, look, they're square pegs. If you shave off the edges to fit them into a world that only prizes round holes, you're going to cut off the best stuff. Hmm. So the key is how do you have them identify their passion, and most parents know early, feed it and let them turn it into a pathway because it's not a prison. OK, we got this video. You got to see this. This is us doing it. So Tom knows about this. When the book came out two years ago, you know, I spoke to the UN General Assembly and Congress and NIH. And we got avalanche of parents from all over the world saying, I get it. I see now my kid for who they are. But what do I, how do I do this? You know, I work out of the house, so does my wife. And we can't sit in the basement watching Disney movies for the next 10 years. So help us. So what we did is we grabbed neuroscientists and technologists from all over the country, pulled them together in a kind of consortium to build what we kind of knew we needed. And it's a platform. It's a new kind of communications platform. It's called Sidekicks. Owen named it, number one. And actually, Owen is on the patent for guided personal companion that was approved by the US Patent Office. My goodness. Because he helped us come up with the idea. So here it is. So this is a four minute video. Just hold it for one second. Let me explain what happens. What happens is the kids download an avatar on their phone. They get to pick which one they want. When you talk into your phone or type or into your computer, it comes through in real time in the voice of the character, wherever they are. You could be in Mumbai doing it. They talk right back to it. It's all automated speech recognition, natural language understanding. So it picks up their speech. And you're having a mediated conversation that breathes life into the entity. The entity mirrors their interests. It loves what they love. Because what we have is we have thousands of clips from Disney and Warner Brothers and all the big content providers. These kids love what everyone loves, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Disney, that stream across the platform. That's the stuff of their language, after all. The, the video runs, and the sidekick then, you behind the curtain, a therapist, a parent, a brother, sister, speaks to them about what they see, the big matching game. I know what Ariel feels, but what do you feel? Hmm. And what does this tell you? How can you apply that to your life? What does this tell you about yourself? Code breaking with human essence assistance. The neat part, and a lot of you guys, these AI, you're a lot of you AI people here, <laughs> is that because this is the dialogue is context aware. They know who the person is. It's not one to many, it's one to one. And domain limited, because that's autism. It, and it, it not only the subjects are domain limited, but it's an individual. It grows into automation with significant speed. Wow. So the person's needed behind the curtain less and less. And then only when needed, they're summoned. So these are the first three kids, all spectrum kids, to use the device. Last year at a, at a thing we did at a university, a usability study. Now, we knew all their affinities. I think the girl is a frozen girl. Uh, the boy is a Toy Story boy, the little guy. And the other guy's a Star Wars guy. 
Each of them showed a higher level of expressive and receptive speech and connection than basically the parents had ever seen on the first usage. Wow. It's crazy. OK, so watch this video. It's very cool. Crazy. Hey there. I'm Jazz, your new sidekick. Nice to meet you. Hey, I heard you really like Disney movies. Is that right? Yes. Want to watch a funny video? Yeah, I do. I don't have a skull. Or bones. <laughs> She's laughing. That was really funny. This is a very useful tool for okay. family like us. Because we are currently stuck. So we know his deficit is, but we don't know how to help him. A lot of the hard work that's been done with him in the last seven years around emotions and other people's emotions and his emotions and how they all interact. If I had had this device seven years ago, he would be a lot further along than where he is now. I like burgers. What do you like? Pizza. Would you share it with me? Yes. If I had asked him, what do you like to eat? He yeah. would not give me that same information. That's a very simple question yeah. to us. I don't get an answer. I, I like pizza or a burger. I have visuals at home usually. Yeah. I have them on the fridge. And it's like, well, what do you think you'd like to eat? And, and he goes over there and he'll pick the visuals. At home, he only do requests. Okay. Like, I want this, I want that. It's very hard for him to initiate conversation to express himself. Thanks. Everybody say bye house! Woody the van! Bye house! It's kind of weird that they say goodbye to the house. <laughs> okay. Why do they do that? Because he, it, he is moving to the trap and Woody's plan worked. Have you ever felt afraid or ashamed of being different from other people? Sometimes. Maybe we can watch a clip to understand how you feel. Sure thing. You belong down in Arendelle. So do you. No, Anna, I belong here. Alone. Where I can be who I am. Without hurting anybody. Have you ever been afraid and wanted to be alone? Sometimes. Why? Because I'm, because I have low self-esteem and autism. Doing this, yeah. taking on this other persona in order to her, her to have a conversation. I could more anonymously talk to her, have her explain her thoughts without it being mom. Right. Which speaks volumes. Amazing to get him to this point where he's actually interacting with the devices. But I think the ease of use comes out of the use of characters. The voice also helps. The visual helps. We go to the therapist a lot because in the different environment he behaves very differently. That's why I think it's good to you can do it at the therapist and then do it at home. Try to generalize the skill he learned and the practice at home. Okay. That's why I think it's a very useful app. This is a very good one. There's a therapist that works with her um, that she sees outside, just a personal one. And I think something like this would probably be a great thing to sell to that field. But I would have used this as a tool with him. Uh -huh. maybe to get him to express his feelings of grief around his father. Okay. Because it's always a very difficult topic. And with the use of the character, it would have been much easier to get him to talk about it. What's some other stuff in your own words about what it's like to use Sidekick? So that way I can speak to her when, when I'm in distress. So that way I can talk to her, her and, and, she, and she understands how I feel. Can you think of anything that we could change or add to make Sidekick better? We can add my favorite movies like Inside Out and um, Miss Cinderella and, and Paul Blart Mall Cop and Home and Pixels. You think it was okay? Or did you like it a lot? I like it a lot. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Anything else you want? To share with us or ideas Why about... we get it? <laughs> oh. Do you have any other feedback for us about Sidekick? Oh, it was really great. Wow. Yeah, that's wow. cool stuff. Yeah.
So this is his brave new world. We're, we're releasing it in the next month or so. We have a hundred uh, folks who've taken it home now uh, in the pilot, and it's uh, it's amazing. Like like the the heavy set kid whose dad died. So he talks to the sidekick. And what's interesting is that all, some of them know that a parent's behind the curtain. They don't care. Actually, no one cares. Even neurotypicals kind of don't care. You know, it's symbolic speech. It's shadows on the cave wall. It's the way we communicate through shared context, just like in the movie theater. And, uh, and, and so he was talking to the sidekick. The mom's in the bedroom. He's in the den. And he says, do you have a family to Griff, the sidekick, the avatar, and the mom's like, <gasps> you know, and she types, no. And he's like, do you have a father? And he's, no. He's like, I don't either, but I know how to be, and I'm going to be okay, and I can help you. And then he, the mom, of course, is bawling her eyes out. He runs up to the bedroom, and, and he says, my psychic doesn't have a dad either, but I'm going to help him. That's like Mozart. That's an orchestra playing. You know, and, and the thing that I love about Paul Bart Mall Cop, which is, you know, <laughs> is that that's actually something that echoes with us a lot, and I think a lot of families, is that when I say the ASD folks are just are brilliant consumers and appreciators of film, of music, I mean, they, they're all running their own music and film appreciation classes in a way, because they have to be. They've got to draw more from it, because they're not drawing from this like we do. And so, so uh, like there's a scene where she, she's the girl, Caitlin, is telling the mom, here's what I need you to feed it. I know what I'm using. So there was a moment in the book where that happened where Jonathan Freeman, the voice of Jafar, you know, came to our house to visit because we became, became buddies. And uh, he comes down for breakfast, and Owen is playing Whole New World. And John was like, Owen, are you playing that for me? <laughs> and I was like, no, I, I play that every morning to get ready for my day, <laughs> which is exactly what he does. <laughs> he's already got hundreds of clips and passages of music that he's using, just like Temple Grandin uses her squeeze machine to integrate, to organize, to inspire, to ground for all the things that we instinctively do or maybe don't do. And that's what's neat about it, is that it's very interactive, and more and more the kids take control of it. And because it's mobile and it grows automation, it's, it's their support as they go into the world. I mean, I'm a content guy. I've been doing content my whole life. It's so exciting to think about content living more fully and deeply in people's lives, where they actually live. I mean, that's the dream for all available knowledge that's now sitting on a PDA. That's, and these kids, I think, are going to lead that charge. That's the most exciting part about it. Look, we all talk about big data and automation. You know, it's not there yet. Because the exchanges are so rich and so specific to the individual, that the data grows into automation more forcefully. Look, we can still plug in the API as to whatever Cortana or Siri's doing on movie times and pizza toppings. That's fine. But in terms of, of something that tailors itself to who you actually are, that's what this does for this population that really needs it. So that's why we're going right at the at-need populations, a lot of them, autism first, but ADHD, OCD, PTSD. I mean, someone from the UN calls says, look, how about refugee populations? They've all got androids, all those kids. So we're going to get a gathering of specialists in trauma, and we're going to build something that sits on your platform that they can talk to and grow with. That's the crazy thing that's going on with sidekicks. So I've been yakking too much here. Can we get a couple questions? We still have five <laughs> minutes, at least. Um, and actually, a question sort of related to that, because both of you may have an interesting perspective to share, but I'm really curious um, what companies can do for employees, because I know this is specific to our world and I'm in Pops, but I, I have the experience that I have a feeling there are a lot of folks here who would benefit from an environment that's more receptive to their special talents. Um, so what can we do as a company? I'm really curious. It's a, it's a, a time of change. People are seeing that differently abled is not just a PC term. 
it's a term that's actually more reflective of what is true. So, so I think part of it is, again, changing the wider populations, whether in the workplace or beyond it, uh, to say, OK, well, uh, this is just a wide gap of deficits and strengths. I'm 50-50, Owen's 30-70. So it means that you've got to place both the 30 and the 70 in your model. Hmm. You know, to say, yeah, I know we support him on the 30. Oh, yeah, that's hard. He needs to take breaks, and he needs the lighting change. He's got to work at home some. But I think the key to that in the way human beings are and the way enlightened self-interest works, and that's kind of the only thing that really makes the world turn, you know, for better or for worse, is to prize the 70 right. as it is. You know, a friend of mine at Harvard, I teach a class called uh, Public Narrative and Justice at Harvard Law School, and I have a lot of buddies there. And this guy, Howard Gardner, who's the multiple intelligences guy. So I've known him for years. He's an amazing guy. And at one point, I'm like, Howard, it would have been great if we had built yardsticks for like the other seven, eight kinds of intelligences, other than just analytical cognitive, which is the winning yardstick for everything. He's like, yeah, that would be great. It's hard to do first. But maybe now we can start doing that. Because, you know, Owen does certain things four and five times better than me. He should be measured on that, and me too. Mm. And I teach at Harvard Law School, OK? He should get credit for being my, a 4x of me. That's how we start to see them as they are, prize them in the workplace, support them as part of a larger corporate purpose. You know, I mean, just a little funny story that says it so powerfully is I gave a speech at this brain conference in Tel Aviv. And, you know, it was a great Shimon Perez was there. It was really exciting. And so I talk about all this. And a guy walks up to me from Israeli intelligence. Now, I wrote a book in 2006, one of those big kind of doorstops on, called The 1% Doctrine about the war on terror. And, you know, let's say his name's Avi. Okay. And I'm like, Avi, how are you? Hey, Ron, it's nice to see you. <laughs> he said, I heard you were coming to Tel Aviv. I said, yeah, yeah. We love the last book. I said, you mean The 1% Doctrine, not the terrorism? No, no, the one about your son. Really? Yeah, yeah. We have a division at Israeli intelligence. Two dozen autistic spectrum young adults. Wow. They see patterns in the data we cannot see. Wow. They're our secret weapon. Wow. They keep Israel safe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and I'm like, so they want to watch movies. Let them watch movies. And I love that story. Wow. Because it's someone under duress, the Israelis, seeing things with clarity, as the Israelis will. And that feels like the future to me. Once you start seeing it that way, you say, I want 10 of them, 20. And what's the special skill here? Oh, this is, not, can we measure that? Oh, that's fabulous. The other part of it, though, it's not even the big muscle in terms of some of that heightened ability. It's also the social supports. And I'll tell you, and every parent, I know Eileen feels this way. You know, everybody, and certainly Paulette knows this in her life, is that when there's a person who's different, whether it's a spectrum person or any person who's neurodiverse among neurotypicals, they make us all better. They just do, because they call the same question that Owen called in our family. I mean, I could go survey 20 businesses as to workplace atmospherics, how they treat employees, how they treat, each other, how they treat customers, and then I could plant a spectrum person in each business, resurvey them, everything will improve. They'll treat each other better in the workplace. They'll treat customers better when they come in. Customers will come to see the person. It's their favorite employee. That's complex, hard to measure, but absolutely true. So the question is, how do we get there? And I think everyone's getting it. You know, and we're just a part of it. All of us here, and, and if it's going to happen, it's going to happen here. You know that. This is Google, for, for Christ's sake. You guys are, are grasping the, the reins of the future in terms of especially data. You know, I'm, I'm a journalist. We had no data forever. I never even knew who read the stories I wrote in the journal. You've got data which reveals us as to who we really are. It's going to happen at a place like this, here or at Facebook or at Microsoft or one of the big shops. Because people say, OK, we have the horsepower. And by virtue of the fact that we are embracing neurodiverse people 
who are stars and are valued members of our teams, we're changing and we're seeing it. And now we know what to do. So on that powerful note, Ron, thank you for the storytelling and inspiration. Yeah, for the book.